Hello, how are you doing? Um, I'm gonna go through a Foundry Showcase video today. This one is gonna be for the Selenka Pass. For a long time, I thought that this would be a very long video because anyone who's been following my campaign will know that my Selenka Pass in Curse of Strahd has been extremely long. Um, near enough 17 sessions heading up. I've added a huge amount of other locations and fleshed it out in a lot of ways to tie into my campaign. So I thought this video would end up being huge. When I've been actually sitting and thinking about making it though, I've realized what well, obviously these videos are specifically showcases for how I've used Foundry for Curse of Strahd locations. So actually a lot of the extra stuff that I've added in to flesh out my Selenka Pass isn't really Foundry stuff, it's just DM and storytelling stuff. So there's a lot of stuff I'm not actually going to touch on at all here. Um, Zelenka Pass and how I used it and implemented it into my campaign's foundry, if you don't know, is a snowy path tucked away, heading up into the mountains in southern, southwestern Barovia uh, that takes them all takes players all the way up to the Amber Temple, which is a very significant um, and dangerous in-game location. It's meant to be remote, very, very remote, which is difficult to do in a place as small as Barovia. Are you really meant to believe that no hunters or adventurers have ever really gone, it's just up that mountain? Um, in the book, you, if you take it completely raw, you head off the Svalich Road, You've got maybe a day's travel with possibly one random encounter in until you get to the Selenka Gatehouse, you can see here in this art, and then another day's travel after that to get to the temple. Are we to believe that this ancient, forgotten, tucked away temple is two days' walk away? Um, I thought that was rubbish. So, in mine, without I've increased the travel, you know, the size of my Barovia very slightly just so that there's a little bit more travel. I mean, we're talking of doubled the distances, which isn't much of a valley. It just means occasionally, I mean, I don't think my group have ever actually had to camp out so my, you know, overnight, traveling from settlement to settlement. So my Barovia is still very small. However, similar to how you've seen in my Berez video where I did a hex crawl, um, I wanted it to be magically confusing. I didn't do a hex crawl for Selenka. Uh, mainly because I think it is difficult to hex crawl a mountain ascent. You know, you, you always head up, especially when you have factors to consider that, like, by this point of the game, my group had access to some flying creatures. My ranger can summon giant owls. My cleric has spider climb. So any when in doubt, you can just start spider climbing up and see what he sees. So yeah, you have to sort of think, and a hex crawl wasn't really appropriate. So I added a lot of locations. Um, I'll click through some of them, but I'm, I'm not gonna go through everything that I've done. I probably have about 15 extra scenes, most of which are random encounters, but I don't feel that any encounter should just be roll a dice and see what happens. I, I even like my random encounters to, to tie in. So I might have two or three pre-configured setup encounters that are random that I'll get the group to roll on. Um, so, talking through how I did it in my campaign, I don't like the idea that technically you are meant to go from an environment that looks like this, and I'm not using ambient sound today on this video. Oh, I've got some players, characters on here, sorry. Let me just uh, increase the lighting. Yeah, I don't like that you're, with one day's travel, and I, bear in mind, I've added the ambient snow and mist effects on here. That snow isn't on there normally. One day's travel to get from this to that. I, I don't like that at all. So what I did with mine is I added a stretch of region or a stretch of random encounters I call Barovian Highlands. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is using resources from Lunch Break Heroes, Dragon of Carter, and Mandy Mod. Um, three very prominent Curse of Strahd supplementary con um, content creators. 
I've picked and mixed little bits of, of what I like from each of them. I've used a lot of Lunch Break Heroes in particular for Selenka Pass and the Amber Temple, which I'll be covering in another video. Um, but I wanted to have a, a feeling of travel from... I didn't like the idea of going from a dark wooded road to snowy mountains. So I incorporated a number of maps. Again, I won't go into the plot detail of which too much. Um, but maps which gradually gave a scale of... I've got to light this one up, haven't we? Of a gradual ascent. Slightly more rocky, hilly paths. Um, eventually ending in a bit of a switchback pass. Again, if you haven't been following my campaign, my Barovia is in constant nighttime at the moment. Strahd has basically put out the sun. Um, so a lot of all of my maps are, are nighttime at the moment, which is made for some terrifying social encounters and combat encounters for my players when the light spells are snuffed out. Um, so yeah, several slightly hilly paths ending in a bit of a high rise switchback pass here. This is the map um, I slightly adjusted Lunch Break Heroes' um, guide to Selenka Pass to have some dragon statues. And I think, I think in his guide, Lunch Break puts the, these on the Selenka Pass bridge. I already had a combat plan for there, so I moved them a bit earlier. These dragon statues he puts in are silver dragons. They are remnants of the old order of Argonvost. And remember, that order originally served as guarding over the, the Amber Temple and the Dark Powers within, and making sure that nothing could interfere or visit them. So we played it that anything who, anyone who is currently being actively wooed or treated or has a dark gift from a dark power, the gargoyles or the dragon statues will attack them and only them. So my players had a bit of a confusing combat here where I think seven... Seven gargoyles all went piling on one of my players, and they thought it was because he had a light source. We thought it's because he was the biggest. We were trying all sorts. They never learned what it fully was, and that player has since rejected that dark power uh, completely. So they won't have a, they won't have that encounter on the way back, I think. But I moved that encounter to here, so I had a number of um, you know gargoyles dotted along the map. Um, I had the tokens invisible. And I found a nice asset of like a little dragon statue. So I had the dragon statues up here, just as map assets. Tokens, ooh, tokens ready and hidden off to the side. And when combat was triggered, I just deleted the assets, revealed the token, and combat began. So yeah, that was a great little map. After that, I had them go on just a bit of theatre of the mind travel. Um, until we eventually came to our first raw map. Let me just clear a few of these off, make some space. Our Selenka, oh, wrong one, our Selenka Pass map, quite a large map file. It might take a moment to load. Just enough time to swig some coffee. Now, this, this is a large map. Now, this is where my, my foundry and my foundry specific advice starts, really. Um, for a map this big, I feel like you could and possibly should trim this. Because although I have a very good, a very good connection, about 500 meg wired, uh, my connection, and my players all have good connections, this is a very large map. There's not a huge amount on it. But as a high resolution fact, you can even see there's a little bit of, of dragon when I move it around. Um, so I would be tempted, if I were you, to make this a couple of scenes. You could crop you could crop the inside of the tower and have that be a scene. You could snip off from the map and have the, the actual map crossover be a different map, especially if you're planning a combat on it. Um, a lot of it is is unneeded. So, for example, <clears throat> this is a difficult map to do in Foundry. Let's consider the different types of visual we've got. If we have token vision and line of sight, so, you know, things are blacked out until your players see them, 
then your players will probably never see. And you can even see how small my pings are here. You know, this is a five foot square. Um, our players are never going to see these reference diagrams because you're presumably going to have walls or terrain walls on here for the steep cliffs. Remember, each line, these are very, very sheer cliffs. The distance between each of these triangled lines is 100 feet. So you are really on what well, the artwork I showed before demonstrates what sort of ascent we're on. And I think it's important for you to realize and for you to highlight this to your players, but you know, falling off here should mean death. Now, unpopular opinion, if you're familiar with Curse of Strahd and the content of it, I don't like Sangzor. I do not like the idea that your players can survive to this long point in your campaign and then get headbutted off a cliff by a goat randomly and die and be out of the campaign. That's insane to me. There is no way I feel that that can feel good for your players or, or for you by this late stage of the game. I've seen a lot of people say they, they have Sangs or instead be the, um, the mountain tribe's most powerful warrior. I, I like thing. I, I didn't go with that, but I very much like that idea. Um, so yeah, making, making it apparent to your players, even though the note is only up here and your players don't see it, I don't think it would hurt for you to add a little text box and foundry here, just highlighting how sheer the drop is here. You know, each line being 100 foot means death. So, if you have token vision, your players are not going to see this. They are also not going to see um, the floating out gatehouse here, because presumably you're going to have to put a, walled a wall in here to wall it off. Otherwise, players stood here will see, you know, over there and see this other floating gatehouse. I like to crop and save things like this as separate images, which I can then bring up for my players in a journal reference. Now, because I have that James RPG art, that animated um, splash screen you just saw, let me just go back to it. Where are we? Yeah, because I have things like this, which are absolutely spectacular, I didn't really need to refer to that art. But you might not have bought into this particular Patreon artist, into James RPG art, and you might want to show, you might actually want to use this instead. Got to wait for it to load again now, a chance for another swig of coffee. So you, it might be worth you cropping that or just screenshot on this area, save it as a separate picture file, bring it up as a journal reference. Maybe do the same for the gatehouse. So you can just bring up these little um, visual references for your players without cluttering the map itself. When it comes to how I chose to wall this, I did terrain walls here so that my group could see that there is an ascent, but they aren't able to see past this point. Um, I did not put anything here. I think I did originally have it, but one of them started spider climbing around and ended up deleting the wall. Same for my walls on here. Originally, I did have walls on here. I had a, um, and one of my players did not like my walls and made it very clear that he did not like my walls. Um, but I had something basically like this. I wanted them to be able to see that there was a, a barrier they couldn't get through. Um, I chose to have my the, the gate be an invisible wall across the portcullis. So if I go in and I pick invisible walls, and I think just to make sure there was no accidental glitch and through, I just did that. So my players couldn't get inside the wall, but they could see through the portcullis to the curtain of flame which I've turned off now, but if I just put it back to nighttime for a moment, and right click, I had quite an active green flame curtain effect. So as they're coming up the Solenka Pass in the dark and in the night, again, like I mentioned, nighttime in my campaign. So this cliff was actually very scary for my group because they had no, they had no reference of what they were seeing until they were pretty much, until they got in the green flame and were able to see through a bit of sort of light spilling out just how quickly that cliff dropped off. It was rather worrying for them.
Um, the gatehouse. So the gatehouse was easy enough to wall off. Um, I obviously have... I don't know why I've put terrain walls in hindsight for these windows. And, and you'll do this. I must have mapped this out over a year ago, this map, when I was very new to Foundry. Even looking at this, there are changes I'd make now mapping it. I would not be using... I just can't think why I use terrain walls for windows in here. If I were doing that now, I would obviously be using invisible walls instead. Um, I set a terrain wall as well for some reason here for the banister. Presumably so they can just see through it. In hindsight, again, I'd, I'd use invisible walls nowadays as a more experienced foundry user. Uh, invisible walls that they can see through. I found early on that I used to use terrain walls for too many things. An example I gave you was in my Argon Vostholt video. Um, specifically, the if you, if you know Argon Vostholt, you'll know there is a little chapel area with a couple of revenants in. And one floor up, there is like a wooden balcony and a throne overlooking it. And it's kind of like a U on its side. A C. So it's a C-shaped or C-shaped for you. Can't remember how, how a camera works. Yeah, C-shaped according to my little screen. Um, wooden balcony. And I set it all off with terrain walls. Well, what I realized as we went into the session is a player who was stood up here now couldn't see a player stood there across empty space because he's looked through one terrain wall for his banister, but he can't see through the bottom terrain wall. Don't, don't use terrain walls very often. Um, I use them probably less than any other wall now, and I mistakenly use them constantly at the start. When you have a situation like this, and something else I, I would do, which I didn't do back then, is I'd be using multi-level tokens here now um, to go and set up a travel box to go one floor higher. I can't even remember how to use multi-level tokens now. It's been so long. Um, let me go in here. It is multi-level tokens. So I would say this is both an in and an out, and I would call this um, tower ground floor, first floor. Americans that might not like that, I'm afraid, but to me, an Englishman, the lowest floor that, is, that isn't a basement is the ground floor. When you head up a flight of stairs, you are on the first floor. I appreciate it is different in some other parts of the world. So this is a teleport box. It's both an in and an out, and it's teleport for the tower between ground floor and first floor. I'm just going to say, okay. I will then go to the next floor, and I will go multi-level token, in out. I copied and pasted before, tower, ground floor, first floor. Now, when it comes to walling things off like this, when you're in your tower, now I didn't do this because it was nighttime in my campaign and I knew my players couldn't see this far, but if you were playing in a normal campaign, where it's daytime, I would, again, I'd consider lifting these two out and taking them away and making them their own scene or just walling off. If you're going to be describing to your players how they just see 30, 40 foot, 100 foot into mist, maybe you're going to let them see over the whole you know, Valley of Barovia and give them a very nice you know, narrative. If you're not going to do that, or even if you are, you can't show them in the game. I'd be tempted just to wall all this off. Oh, not with an invisible wall, though. That would do nothing. So I'm going to put a regular wall in here. And now I don't have to worry about my players being stood on the path going, oh, well, what's all this? I can see how many floors per tower is inside because I can see all of that. So I am just going to do that. And at least now my players just see nothing. And as a DM, I can describe what they see. What I've also done here is, and I mentioned this in the Bone Grinder. I don't like the Bone Grinder. The Bone Grinder um, Foundry Showcase video. Because one scene shows multiple floors of a place, I like to wall it off. So your players can't, because it's weird for your players to look out the window and see part of the building they're currently in, one floor up. A player who looked out this window would be able to see the roof of the tower. 
Now, that's why I've surrounded it by walls, so that they can't see what's on the roof. Imagine I had Strahd's token on here waiting to see them, and I'd forgotten. Your players are going to start making jokes. You know, even if they still stick to character and may still go up, it's going to affect their decision-making on some level, seeing Strahd's token. So I always wall off different floors. Um, again, I've used terrain walls here, and that's stupid, because if I were to pull an NPC onto this map now, Remember, you can see through one terrain wall. So here, he can look around. But if I were to get here, see now, he now can't see someone who is stood there. That's really, really stupid by, by past Harrison. Um, so do not do what I did back here in whatever. This would have been one of the first, I think this was one of the first maps I ever mapped out in Foundry. Um, the Selenka Pass. So that would have been like, what? April, May last year. Feels very weird I've been using Foundry less than a year. I had to fire up my old, I used Fantasy Grounds before this, and I used Fantasy Grounds for about five, six years before I started using Foundry. I had to load up my old Curse of Strahd world and Fantasy Grounds to like confirm an item that a player had that they'd lost. And my God, I can't believe I, I was ever using something that wasn't Foundry. It was very difficult to even click around it. Um, some changes I made here. Oh, and again, something else I, I haven't mentioned yet. I, for most of Curse of Strahd, went through just for, and I know there are tools out there that can convert or can do naughtier things with official content. All my journal entries I've made myself. So when I go in and I look in each location, and I've got Selenka Pass and I've got Selenka Gatehouse, I manually added each of these because for me, I, and I didn't copy and paste the text either. It's just for me, typing it all out again really reinforces it for me. So I just made, obviously, the area of Selenka Pass, areas for well, each sub-area has its own folder. And then in there, I made my old journal entries um, and I've added my info in there. Even if some of it is just, you know, I have, the cur I have my Curse of Straw book here um, and I was just reading and, and typing out. A lot of people will not want to do that. For me, I mainly did that for Amber Temple and for Ravenloft because just sitting there and reading those books is impossible to... You know, imagine trying to remember what's in the, the Ravenloft catacombs just from reading the book once and closing it. So for me, reading it, typing it out, putting walls around it and putting, you know, lighting and dragon journal entries into the place, for me personally... That massively reinforces it in my mind. And I feel like I could do Ravenloft from memory now, other than maybe what items are in what rooms, um, other than like the big ones. So you may, if you're struggling, and this doesn't apply to Curse of Strahd, this could apply to the Tomb of Annihilation or whatever dungeons are in any other module. Um, if, you're, if you're struggling reading and seeing the size of somewhere and you're doing it in Foundry, I very much recommend doing what I've just described. It, it reinforced it hugely for me. I made changes to the gatehouse based on Lunch Break Heroes' guide to Selenka Pass. Um, the werewolf, Emil Torinescu, like many things, and you'll hear more about this when I do my Ravenloft videos, I, I don't think it's a very good idea to have quest items in Ravenloft. And same for quest NPCs. I get that some groups would be happy to break into Ravenloft, and to you know, try and do a heist or steal something. Personally, my players are so terrified of Strahd that I... D oh, look, a little sad face over here in the snow. Uh, sorry, that distracted me for a minute. Um, my group will not set foot in Ravenloft until the end encounter, and they have so many allies with them. The idea of them breaking into Ravenloft to steal a dragon's skull, which is the size of a horse carriage. They just wouldn't, they wouldn't even consider it. And same for Emil. If your players are digging around the prison and dungeons below Ravenloft, chances are it's the end game. So having an NPC related to quests, <coughs> particularly something that, if you think about it, could be a step towards, depending on what your players are like, turning the werewolves against Strahd. You know, I think a lot of groups depose Kirill, um, get Emil back in charge, and maybe Emil could be 
more positively disposed to help in the group against Strahd. It's a bit too late if you find him in the, in the dungeons of Ravenloft, I think, because you've probably all, your party have probably already committed to the final battle. Or they're fighting Strahd, heading down the tunnels, they hear a cry come from that room, hey, help, and we're like, no, there's no time. And it's a loose end for your campaign. Um, so Lunch Break Heroes has moved him here. I won't go into all the why and all that, because his videos cover that, and I want to keep this about Foundry. But I went and bought a nice, he's imprisoned here. I went and bought a nice um, token for a prison cell, a cage, dragged that on here as an asset, and I just had a meal. I described him theater of the mind until they, you know, they're talking to him and in conversation, and then I reveal the token. One thing I hadn't done by this point, because it didn't keep happening, one of my players has now just taken to creating bonfires in any, any open fireplace while they're talking, especially now it's always night and it's dark and it's cold. Um, he, his fire is often blue with his character. So I will normally, if I see any sort of bonfire on my map, um, fireplace on my map now, I will make that character's fire effect or copy it from a previous map and just toggle it off. So that if he does do it, I'm not going, one second, uh, light tool dragged. Which shade of blue is it? Right, what, what was the lighting effect I picked on? 20 and 40, 40, isn't it? I just go, right click, it's on. If anybody else is going to put a fire, no one else is going to take the time to start a fire with my group. If you have someone like that, if you have the I cast a fire, I cast formaturgy, consider making your effects on the map beforehand and hiding them. Remember, since a relatively recent update in Foundry, Lights can just be toggled off and on with a right click. A lot of people still don't know about that. Um, and you can, even across scenes, go to a mouse over a light effect, control C to copy it, control V to paste it. Very handy if you have a specialist lighting effect or if you spend time making one torch sconce and then want to just duplicate it across all the others. There's a ladder to the roof. I didn't want to make a multi-level token for that. It's just a bit awkward to do, really. But then we have a roof. Heading back, we have the gatehouse. Um, one thing that I found difficult here with, and I tried a few different ways of concealing this, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because, again, my campaign was different. With it being nighttime and being dark, it is difficult to look at this map and really realize that you are 500 feet above this river. It is, an, you know, a drop into this river should be killing you. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people, I don't think the map can fit, conveys that very well. I know you've got these arrows indicating it, but I don't think there's a good sense of scale. So in my nighttime campaign, no one would be able to even see the river. And it was difficult. I tried creating light effects. You can do light effects, but have a negative value, um, a negative light value, um, which create an area of darkness, but they're very heavy handed. They're near enough black holes, but wasn't a good way to do it. So I did just have to say to my group, look, you can hear the river, but you can't see it. Because it was nighttime and I had quite a battle planned here. I had um, Rahadin with, I think, four vampire spawn waiting here. Um, Rahadin was just there the vampire spawn were all clinging to the side of the bridge and came up after a round and I had Basophiles the nightmare uh, nearby ready for a quick escape Rahadin actually escaped here with 2 HP um, on the back of Basophiles if I make it night time I wanted the bridge to look a bit cool so I had that there was a single beam of moonlight out onto the bridge the main reason I wanted to do that, and this was possibly the first Foundry video I ever did, is that you will see here, I have a bloody great big token of the rock. And what I did was, after a round of combat, when players were all on the bridge and fighting away, I did two things. I went to my soundboard app, although to be fair, I wasn't using the soundboard app at that point. It, it wasn't out yet, so I was using the playlists. I've got in here Rock Cry. As my combat was, now I haven't done this in a while, so this might not work first time, but as my players were all on here, like bathed in the, the thin beam of moonlight having a fight, they all heard. So 
sorry, I had some music on before. My speakers are very loud. I'll try that again. I hope it doesn't deafen you. And as we, as we heard that cry. Oh no, does it, can I get it to do it now? There we go. I just saw this enormous, and all this is is a token. I got a token of a bird's um, shadow, made it slightly translucent. And this is actually an actor called Rock Shadow. It was the easiest way to do it. It has, I think I just cloned the rock and renamed it Shadow and just have that pass over. And you'll see if I pause it over the light, you'll see it is translucent. And that made my players shit themselves um, with that happening. And it interrupted the fight quite a bit. Just to give them a, just a highlight to them that they're, they're getting higher. Um, I don't know what this light effect is. Obviously, someone on one of my players, yeah, one of my players obviously had a light on his shield before they left the map. Um, I don't know why that rock token is on there as well. Compass Rose, another gatehouse piece of art that you might want to have on a separate map uh, or as a cropped image to show them. But that's the Solenka gatehouse. Progressing from there, uh, my group headed up through a Solenka pass. I had a number of. Um, random encounters prepared for them. Sometimes the random encounter maps were for random encounter combat. Other ones I just used for them to, I mean, my, my group like to, they've got assets for setting up their camp um, and they are really big on the RP. My group, you know, again, it comes up quite a lot on the Curse of Strahd Discord. My group had six hours of conversation with the Abbot before they had combat with him. They've just met Exophanta in the library at Amber Temple. There's a bit of a sweep going on the Curse of Strahd Discord of how long do we think they're going to be in there talking to him for. My group are talkers. We have had some in-game days that have been longer than actual days. Um, we had, I think, we realised once, we, we do three-hour sessions, and we realized that a single in-game day had been nine sessions. We were like, well, hold on. <laughs> we've, we've, we've role-played longer than the day actually is long. Um, so I, I make maps just for camping. What I did use is um, I employed, I think it's Dragna Carter who did this one. Sorry, if not, the idea of the mountain folk and the settlement of um, Yedrag. I brought the mountain folk in quite early, around Yester Hill. I wanted to make it clear in my game that the forest folk or the druids weren't just all evil druidic strad worshippers. Some had fallen under Baba, um, Baba Yaga, Baba Lasaga. Um, some were their own people up in the mountain. There's no denying it, it is very Game of Thrones wildlands. You know, three peoples of the mountains who've avoided all of the politics and things like that. It is very Game of Thrones. Um, but they encounter a boy frozen in a lake. They go to a settlement for, if I just get, if they find their way. So in my, my group, they rescued the boy. They saved him from, I think it was some winter wolves that were trying to trick the group. The winter wolves very nearly tricked my group into thinking that they were protectors of the boy and very nearly ate him. But one of them had comprehend languages up. So yeah, they got away. The boy took them to his village, and for that village, I used two things. To give it more of a sense of passing through, I used a map from the Mad Cartographer's uh, Curse of the Frost Maiden map set. I don't know why a Barovian commoner is on this map. Very strange. Um, and I don't know why he's so big. I've obviously used this map for something else since. Um, and the rune, the rune remains, who knows why. So this is one of the Mad Cartographer's Rhyme of uh, Curse of the Frost Maiden. He did a month of combined Curse of Strahd, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden maps. I used this for actually looking around it. I used this map, which I bought somewhere on Roll20. I can't remember where I bought this one, actually. Oh, yes, Patreon. It's an afternoon map one. To be like the main hall. And I believe... Did I call it Yay Drag? I can't remember. Ah, there we go. The Cavani tribe village. I used this as sort of a reference of how the tents were laid out. Um, you know, this sort of setting with one larger hall. 
you don't always get the exact art for what you're what you're intending to show your players. I don't think there's anything wrong in you saying, here's the map, but by the way, that's not here, or that's this colour, or here's the artwork for the location, but ignore that part of it, please. That's fine. If you have more money than a lot of people, you might want to go out and just commission things for every single variation of how you're going to have it, but I do not have that sort of money. And I've forgotten to silence my phone as usual. I've now done that and I apologize. Let me just make sure it's done on my phone. There's a problem with me not having editing skills and these videos being long. I dread the doorbell going in my house and having to snip this video off like that and do part two. Um, so after our village, they continued up the mountain. We have more, more and more sites, uh, more and more different random encounters. I used, and again, I think this is Dragna Carter. Dragna Carter goes with the idea that there is a demon called a, or a fiend called a Shasuva, roaming the mountain. Um, there are actually a couple of demons, and he's pretty much got it. The, um, my group renamed it the Dagger Dog because it had a big poison. Well, the, the tribe folks described it as having a dagger on its tail, so we've called it the Dagger Dog. Um, Several old wizards from the Amber Enclave, the Amber Temple, you know, corrupted by the magic of the temple, ended up devolving into demons or fiends and basically wandering the Selenka Pass as feral creatures. A lot of DMs go with like a Shasuva versus, is it Hezru, is it pronounced? Like the frog, the frog demon um, that isn't a Nurgalid. Having a, like a Godzilla versus Kong sort of battle on the players in the middle of it. I just want the, with the Shasuva being a tremendously deadly and infamous predator of the mountain. So my group actually spent several days tracking that. Um, what did we have next? What I did with mine, and I'm showing you this of a foundry effect of it. I had at the top of the mountain. So my players had a period of ascent and I had it the, at the end, they had a, they clearly reached the plateaus at the top. And again, to lean into Game of Thrones, when you visualize the beyond the wall stuff, just bleak, I think it was Iceland they filmed a lot of it in, just bleak, endless expanses of tundra. You're not talking about snowy mountains and, you know, paths with pine trees on now. We're just talking snow and ice and rock. Um, I loved that idea that at the top, you just have this. It had been nighttime in my game forever. And although that's scary, it also starts to get a bit boring for players. And I just wanted to throw something in a little bit otherworldly. They are in a location that is above, above and beyond everywhere that most people in Barovia have been. They know they're heading towards this center of, of mystery and secrets and danger. And they're probably quite familiar with Barovia by this point and have mastered a lot of its challenges. So I used, now I can't remember who the artist is, I'm afraid, but this is some another one that the Mad Cartographer did a collaboration with. Um, oh, it's, it's James RPG Art, what am I talking about? Idiot. Um, James RPG Art and the Mad Cartographer did a collaboration. James RPG made the artwork and Mad Cartographer made a corresponding map. Now, I've actually deleted a bit of this because I had some weird, to show you, I work in IT support and I feel like I have quite a lot of technical knowledge, but sometimes I do stupid things. I suddenly found in my foundry that all of these light effects were becoming like really particleized squares. I was reinstalling foundry. I was updating drivers. I was checking my CPU and my processor and everything. In the end, I found out that when I'd taken my computer apart to do something, I'd accidentally plugged my monitor back into the onboard graphics card, not uh, onto the onboard, the motherboard, not onto my actual graphics card. So I had I had nerfed myself severely. What an idiot. Um, with this, though, I wanted to create an Aurora. And I found that overlapping two different colors, and I could have done nice, pretty Aurora, but I, it's Barovia. They're near the dark powers. I, and I kind of, and again, this is me very much talking about my campaign. You might not like this. As my group have found out more and more about vampire, as in the dark power vampire, I've made it clear through 
educated NPCs like the Abbot that Vampire pretty much is the Mists. He's grown so fat and complacent on all these souls that he just surrounds and chokes Barovia. And I thought that a good... And he, you know, he essentially is the Mists. I thought that a good way to visualize that at this, the highest point in Barovia, with you know, such proximity to this huge evil magic of the temple, which is potentially reality, you know, reality altering. We are potentially at the, the highest point of the demiplane, if you will, was to reflect that and be in a bit of a creepier aurora. You might think that sounds like a load of rubbish. Um, I'm always very aware of other people's campaigns, but when I tell you things, I'm giving you a quick explanation of what's in my campaign. In mine, it's very grounded and it's been delivered bit by bit over a year and it feels okay. But you, when you heard me explain that, you possibly did what I do when I hear some other people explain their campaigns, which is, sounds a bit young adult, fan fiction, edgy to me, but, but there you go. So even if you don't agree with the methods, I want to show you the tools. Overlapping, very slow moving ghostly light effects, I feel, makes a very cool Aurora style effect. I also used the corresponding battle map by the Mad Cartographer to do the same. Exactly the same light effects. I actually copied and pasted them over. Even though one was on a theater of the mind map and one was on a um, battle map, I used exactly the same process. Just same lights, same values, lifted them over. And I feel like this was a nice change for my players. For once, they weren't in the pitch black. They weren't shining torches around. And it was weird. I got some really cool music. I won't play it on here because I don't know what the copyright strikes will be on the video. Um, but I used very, almost like softer, sort of stranger, stranger Things upside down. So not 80s. There was no like Whip It by Vivo. Um, but just quiet, unsettling music. But it was quite high in chimes and, you know, I think it gives that sense of being cold and almost spacey. And they found it very, very, uh, very creepy. Last couple of things I'll show you here. I used um, Lunch Break Heroes has done some excellent stuff on Amber Temple, which I have used and I'm continuing to use to my players are at this time. Um, a big part of it, though, is that he pre and I've done I've changed the geography of it a bit. Um, is a temple before the temple. Um, the idea that people didn't all maybe live in the temple. There was a bit of a monastery before it, and I've gone very much of it is built into a mountain pass. So you know, it's a bit railroady. They have to get through this monastery to get to the Amber Temple because they just they get delivered some store, you know, some important story there. I used, I made this map. This is the first map I ever made in Dungeon Draft. Full disclaimer, what you're about to see is terrible. So, so bad. But it serves a purpose. Oh, God. I didn't want to load it. Let me make it daytime. So this is terrible. I really feel the need to reinforce that. I'm not showing you this saying that I think it is good. I'm saying that it got the job done. Uh, especially when restricted to play a vision where they couldn't see all of this. So I added quite a lot of plot-related things in here, for, my, for specific for my campaign, and I also added a couple of enemies in here. I added in some Sapphire Slimes, which are from the Tome of Beasts 2. If you've never checked out Cobalt, uh, Cobalt Press's Tomes of Beasts 1 and 2, they are fantastic. They're huge PDFs. I think you can buy a paperback version, but huge PDFs with art, of some very, very cool monsters. Um, a lot of desert stuff, which is great for a lot of people, obviously not for Curse of Strahd, but there's a lot of desert stuff, a lot of snow stuff, and a huge amount of undead and demons in it. Um, I And also, you know what, there's, there's everything, there's everything in them. I really recommend checking them out. Um, but I use their sapphire slimes in here, just basically frost-related slimes. Um, and the whole purpose of this, you know, I went through... Lunch Break Heroes' video and basically took what he had mentioned in some of the rooms for the story delivery. One thing I always have to do, and if you don't feel like making journal entries for the main story beats, one of my players has Speak With Dead. 
he uses it constantly. And you're very quickly in the position of having to just pull people out of thin air. So when I'm making a map and I know there's bodies in there, if I, I, I will quite often just make a journal entry and just think in advance, what's it going to be called? What does it know? You know, what sort of things does it know? So when my player starts going, I'm going to ask it questions. I'm not going, his name is um, John, John Mug of House webcam um you know just pulling names out your backside so i you know a very big thing you might recognize Mif duran or in there a very big thing in my campaign was just that um people have come from different worlds and realms to barovia it's a bit of a bit of a nexus of places so most of my play one of my players would recognize all the names if i told my group this guy came from Mif duran or a lot four three out of four of my group would be like cool never heard of it do we do we know where that is um, I added a few extra assets in here um, after the fact, a few empty campfires and just items to give it a bit of more interest and scatter than what Dungeon Draft offered at the time. I did make this about a year ago in Dungeon Draft. I've no idea what it's added since. And then that enters, that opens up into a tunnel that has quite a long description from Lunch Break Heroes of the, um, the actual approach to the Amber Temple, at which point... I finally, after 17 sessions of travel, showed my group, where is it, the art for the Amber Temple, which again, I went and put that Aurora effect on. Weirdly, that has changed. That has actually got a, um, you'll notice there is a bit of a, there we go, there is a bit of an ambient light effect more around one of them. You can sort of see the semi the circle in which the the ambience persists it's not copied through properly from my other map you you could fix that better in yours um everything that i've done in this video i pretty much had snowy ambience playing at all times selenka pass i also had maps set up for things like where are we one thing i wanted to do but never actually ended up doing was I wanted to throw at my group a surprise, a deceptively easy snowy pass encounter. Now I had them beforehand. I used my open soundboard. I had avalanches. I had avalanche close, avalanche distant. One day while they were navigating the mountain, I played. I don't know how loud this is going to be on the video. It ramps up a bit, but if you can't hear it, there is the ongoing sound of a distant and far away avalanche at the moment. Oh, here we go, it's, it's catching up now. And sometime later, how long does it go on for? It worked well in a session, it's a bit too long now. Again, remember, you can go in and just say, stop. Sometime later, they, I made them come to a, an area of very, very fresh new clearly come flying down the mountain fresh snow um i did that as pretty much a warning shot that avalanches could happen later they came to this sort of map and i described a lot of snow clinging above on the hill and i had i think it was about 20 wolves just a pack of 20 wolves now at this point in the game my group absolutely destroyed these wolves that was the plan because I wanted to, I wanted to see if any of them would do some. I was waiting for the cleric to see all these wolves and just go, oh, fireball. Because if he had, I was going to trigger an avalanche. Rhyme of Frost Maiden has loads of these rules in. What I found very useful, especially if your Selenka Pass is going to go on for a while, is using the GM screen module I've talked about in one of my module videos. I made journal entries for avalanches, frigid water, and blizzards. Just so that if it comes up during these sessions, I've got a quick reference for it here. I always try and keep um, one of these free for my journal entry called Table Rulings, just because you know, especially with a campaign of my length, you may court, you know, you might have something weird that happens at your table, and you make a decision. Okay, I'm going to call it that this happens. That's good, and I'm fine. You know, people should do that. It's part of the hobby, but. For me, it's an irritation, both as a DM and as a player, when those rulings are inconsistent in the future. 
So if we do make a ruling like that, I like to go and make it, add it into my table rulings, and where possible, I always like to, you know, just, just cite when that came up, just so that if we do have anything come up again in the future, I've got a reference of what we said in the past. Bear in mind, my campaign is currently 118 three-hour sessions long weekly, um, so I we've had a lot of home rulings. I've not been doing this long, so that will end up quite quite a long journal entry, but great in here that I can remember, okay, um, now we have in here, don't we, that it says, you know, twice each round on initiative counts 10 and 0, the avalanche travels 300 feet in Catholic and travel no more. Remember, you've got, if I just clear, if I clear my combat, you can add in, oh, that's something I've just noticed. Let me just go and make a new combat. There, yeah, there we go. I've got um, that combat focus module I talked about in a video, which has squashed, well, condensed my initiative tracker with my chat log on the same screen, so I'm not tabbing in and out, but it means that I've lost a bit of space. Um, you can go temporary combatant. If you're having a fight in an area and you know an avalanche is going to happen, make a temporary combatant, make it hidden, and call it avalanche initiative 10. Oh, no, Joe, let's call it. Avalanche moves, initiative 10, save. Your players won't see that. And add avalanche, oh, can't even type. Avalanche moves two, if you want to differentiate between the two. Initiative zero, also hidden. And now you won't forget as you're going through, if I roll everybody else. You'll now see that as combat goes on, you've got those visual indicators for you on when the avalanche progresses. And click GM screen. If you've got the notes set up already, you've got the exact stuff on how much damage it's going to take. Very, very helpful for you. Saves you going mid-session. One second, the book says, and going in, and going through that. The reason I had the group wipe out those wolves so easily was both for avalanche bait and because, again, in that um, Cobalt Press Tome of Beasts I mentioned, there was a really cool creature which was pretty much a undead pack of this cloud of swirling ghost wolves. And it was like, you know, the lore of it was that, you know, wolves had died in a horrible way on the mountain, and they were going to have, like, that night when they camped. Just It's like the army of the dead from Return of the King, but in wolf form, um, come through the camp. But that ended up not happening for a number of reasons. Right, this video has been almost an hour long. Let me have a quick look through and see if there's anything else. I mean, I'm not going to just click and go through all of the different random encounters I used and why, because I want to keep this Foundry-centric. It was a fun location to do, Selenka. It was very long. Um, a lot of the fun for me came in just having it be much more challenging and having to track things like, because I made it longer, I really wanted my group to feel exposed. They've had a bed in a town most sessions of the entire campaign, so I wanted them camping. I wanted them tracking resources and having to get winter clothes. Um, so a lot of that was DM, DM stuff, really. I did make in my party category, I know there are modules that can do this instead. I might change to one of those in the future, but I've got a NPC, well, a, part, a player character that everybody has access to called the party, just so that we have in the inventory, we've got all of the um, different categories. Now, I like to use Inventory Plus to create custom categories because you might have noticed a lot of things in foundries get lumped into like loot for no reason. So I've got, obviously, here to differentiate between my bag of holding, treasures in the bag of holding, the gore bag. One of my players likes to take heads for Speak With Dead. Um, they're specifically, their their Selenka supplies category. So my players will come in here and mark off their rations as and when they need them. And then other just loot and weapons they've got. That's really, really handy, especially combined with, I can't remember the add-on off the top of my head. I'll try and remember to put it in the description. But the one that lets you send items to players because they can now go in and say, right, I'm going to move that into my bag. I'm going to go send to player. Well, I've not got anybody selected uh, on this map, but it would move it over to them. So that 
I think, is my Selenka Pass walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed it. I imagine if you have watched this all the way through, you've probably done it in a couple of a couple of bursts. I maybe should have split it into two videos, but I don't really know when would have been a good halfway point. So there we go. Um, I will do the Amber Temple very soon. As I mentioned in my sort of state of the channel video, um, I had all of Amber Temple made in a video, and then my players started running it, and I realized loads of more things that I wanted to change and that I'd do differently going forward. So I scrapped that video. And when they finish Amber Temple in a week or two, I will re-record it. I'm thinking of doing Valaki as well, but honestly, Valaki might just be here's the Valaki Town map and here are the maps of the vendors I used. I feel like Valaki is pretty much covered by my how to make a town map video and how to make a shopkeeper video. That's all it is for the two. So I think it will be Amber Temple soon. Then it will possibly be the Werewolf Den. Either when my players do it or when it becomes clear they're not going to do it, I'll make that map. And then we will have a big series of Ravenloft videos. I think Amber Temple will be two videos, one for each floor, and then Ravenloft will probably be one video for each scene, I imagine, except for some of the smaller towers at the top. Really hope you found this useful. If you didn't, well, I'm in trouble because it's almost an hour long, so I wasted both our time. Uh, but yeah, as ever, comment. Let me know anything you want to see, anything you liked, anything you didn't like, and I will catch you next time.